present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us today at the Theatre Royal in Plymouth, a fine city boasting a long history and rich culture. Probably Plymouth's most celebrated son is Sir Francis Drake. Sailing for the Caribbean in 1577, Drake and his men fought their way through a hundred leagues of the Spanish main, ending a solid season as runners-up in Division Two. <laughs> it was from here the Pilgrim Fathers set sail in 1620. Before boarding the Mayflower, these devout Puritans held a service of thanksgivings at the Plymouth Hoe, followed by hymns at the Exeter Shovel... <laughs> and prayers for the Torquay Rotary Mower. <laughs> Their crossing was eventful and even saw the birth of a baby to master and mistress Hopkins. Inspired by the vast expanse of the Atlantic, they named the boy Oceanus Freedom Hopkins. By coincidence, exactly the same thing happened during a commemorative voyage in 1987 and what joy there was amongst the crew at the christening of oil slick Condon Johnson. <laughs> Steeped as it is in the history of seafaring, Plymouth attracts many visitors in search of ancient wrecks. <laughs> <laughs> Some less important examples can sit ignored for years, but still hold a small grain of historical interest for those prepared to look. Let's meet the teams. <laughs> there are on my left... On my left, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. And on my right... Tim Brooke Taylor and Tony Hawks. <laughs> and taking up her position, ready to look after the team's points, please welcome our scorer, the very lovely Samantha. <laughs> Well, let's get on. Our first round takes as its subject eyewitness messages from famous historical events. Without them, we'd have been left ignorant of many of the shifting frontiers of human knowledge. For example, it's thanks only to a few lines on a postcard that we know precisely how Admiral Horatio Wellington was inspired to invent the steam telegraph <laughs> when he observed a sandwich falling from a tree. <laughs> At which point he jumped out of the bath shouting, Eureka! <laughs> so, teams, I'd like you please to suggest what postcards or other short messages might have been sent from various locations throughout the course of world history. And, Barry, will you start, please? Uh, Neville Chamberlain from Munich to Mrs Chamberlain. Weather good, Hitler charming, piece of paper follows. <laughs> Tony. Uh, from the three wise men uh, in Bethlehem. Off to see new messiah who's just been born. Bit of a bummer with it all happening on Christmas Day. <laughs> Graham. Uh, there's a postcard here from Pompeii, which reads, Vesuvius erupted last night. We were all petrified. <laughs> Tim. I got one here from Paul, or it's, actually, it's slightly illegible. It might be Saul from Damascus, and addressed to some friends in Corinth. It reads... Having a blinding time, long letter to follow. <laughs> Jane Austen to her mother. The publisher loves Pride and Prejudice, but says all the effing and blinding has to go. <laughs> There's a rare one here from Florence Nightingale in the, uh, from the Crimea. Dear Matron, all a terrible mistake. In my letter, I said I wanted to go to the cinema. <laughs> um, got one here from uh, Dr Livingstone in the Congo. <laughs> Dear all, what a laugh this is. Stanley turned up again today. This time I hid behind the mud huts. <laughs> Beethoven to his agent. Regarding my next commission, have you heard anything? <laughs> One from uh, Mrs Julius Caesar from Disneyland to her husband. Uh, dear Cs, place full of ghastly children, wish you were Herod. 
Here's one from uh, Kipling in India. <laughs> Weather exceedingly good. <laughs> Beaches exceedingly good. Nightlife exceedingly good. Cake crap. <laughs> I uh, found one here from Hannibal, uh, from the Alps. This is the last time I charter a jumbo from Virgin. <laughs> There's uh, one here from George Stevenson on the rocket on its inaugural journey between Stockton and Darlington. And he writes, Hi, I'm on the train. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> It's time for a musical round now called One Song to the Tune of Another, a concept which is almost too simple for words. <laughs> Without a trace of ostentation and offering no more than plain, uncomplicated straightforwardness, the difficulty of the round lies only in finding les mots justes to describe its lack of pretension and complication, or the ease and clarity which embrace its artless elementalism. Indeed, it's this very lack of convoluted ramification that makes excessive... <laughs> It makes excessive detailed description not only unnecessary, but also superfluous to a point bordering on the tautological. <laughs> it's impossible to describe its lack of advanced, over-contrived, complex compound structure, or its total avoidance of extravagantly woven sophistry. In mere words, these conventional catalysts so expeditious to verbal facility that elucidate conceptual comprehension succinctly and without recourse to extraneous elaboration. If only everything in life was so simple. <laughs> And here's something even harder to explain. <laughs> Colin Sell at the piano. <laughs> right, we'll start with you, Tim. I'd like you to sing the words of Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves <laughs> to the tune of The Teddy Bear's Picnic. <laughs> There was a time when they used to say that behind every great man there had to be a great woman. <laughs> but in these times of change, you know that it's no longer true. So we're coming out of the kitchen because there's something we forgot to say to you. Sisters are doing it for themselves, standing on their own two feet and ringing in on their own bells. Sisters are doing it for themselves. Now this is a song to celebrate the conscious liberation of the female stairs and, and daughters and the daughters too. Woman, woman, woman to woman, we're singing with you. <laughs> the inferior sex got a new exterior. We've got doctors, lawyers, politicians too. Everybody take a look around. Can you see? Can you see? Yeah! <laughs> okay. Graham, I'm going to ask you, in the vain hope that you'll refuse... <laughs> ..to sing the words of Postman Pat to the tune of Robin Hood. Postman Pat, Postman Pat, Postman Pat and his black and white cat Early in the morning, just as the day is dawning He picks up all the post bags in his van Postman Pat, Postman Pat, Postman Pat and his black and white cat All the birds are singing and the day is just beginning feels he's a really happy man everybody knows his bright red van all his friends will smile as he waves to greet them maybe you can never be sure that we are not bring bring letters through your door postman pat postman pat postman pat and his black and white cat all the birds are singing the day is just beginning pat feels he's a really Happy man. <laughs> right, it's your turn, Barry. Would you please sing the words of the Tom Jones song You Can Leave Your Hat On to the tune of Scarborough Fair? <laughs> Baby, take off your coat real slow. Baby, take off your shoes, I'll help you. Take off your shoes, baby, take off your dress. Yes, 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 you can leave your hat on. <laughs> you can leave your hat 
Stand on the chair. <laughs> and finally, Tony, would you sing the words of Harry Nielsen's Without You to the tune of the Can Can? <laughs> well, I can't forget this evening and your face as you were leaving. Well, I guess that's just the way the story goes. You always smile, but in your eyes, your sorrow shows. Yes, it shows that I can't forget tomorrow. I think about my sorrow when I had you there, my dear Then I let you go And now it's only fair that I should let you know what you should know And I can't live and living is without you I can't live without you I can't live, I can't live ever I can't live if living is without you I can't live, I can't live anymore I can't live if living is it without you I can't live without you I can't give, I can't, I can't give anymore <laughs> That was great. <laughs> Listeners who also enjoy television will have been dismayed by the recent news that the long-running One Man and His Dog series has been axed. So few other shows have ever matched the pleasure and excitement of watching a man in a field whistling while a dog chases sheep. <laughs> it... It makes my blood boil to think that this fine programme is to go, no doubt to be replaced by something really dull. If it's dull I want, I can go and do some decorating or tidy up the garden. I wouldn't be surprised if they put those on TV next. <laughs> anyway, to keep a bit of the old magic alive, I'm pleased to say I've managed to secure the radio format of One Man and His Dog. <laughs> Teams, I'd like to please... I'd like you, please, to take it in turns to herd your sheep. <laughs> One team will be the shepherd and his dog. The opposing team will provide a commentary for the benefit of listeners at home. <laughs> so, Tim and Tony, first I'd like you to herd your sheep. Barry and Graham will provide the commentary. OK, Barry and Graham, start commentating, please. Beautiful day. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. now, let's see who, yeah. who's next up. <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh, come boy, come boy now. A great, a great favourite. It's old Bob come Tackett boy. Come boy. and his dog Tiddles. <laughs> he'll, uh, he'll lose points for that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're off. They're off. Uh, they're away to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> These two fellas keep doing that. You can't hear the sheep. <laughs> And, come away, uh, come away, come away, come away. There's Bob with, uh, with his dog. He, uh, dog's called Fluffy, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> woof, woof. Doesn't that, isn't that the, the dog that sings, Graham? It's the famous singing dog, is Fluffy. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> and he's taking them through the sheep dip, and uh, is that guacamole, isn't it? <laughs> But uh, a bit of a character is Bob with his, his farmyard impressions. <laughs> We're probably going to get his Tommy Cooper in a minute. <laughs> Just like that. Oh, <laughs> oh no, we're not. <laughs> oh, Fluffy's uh, driving the sheep along there now. Oh, Fluffy, mirror signal manoeuvre. <laughs> He's got that all wrong. He's got to get them into the, uh, the through the hurdles there, 100 metres in 13.6 is not bad. <laughs> and into the pen at the end. Think he'll do it? I've no idea. They've got Tomb Raider 2 to do yet. <laughs> <laughs> and they better be careful of that disused mine shaft. <laughs> It's your turn to be the sheep and shepherd now, Barry and Graham. Will you please start the commentary now, Tim and Tony? They're out of the pen, mm -hmm. and they're on the bus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's unconventional, that. Yeah, but that's uh, upstairs, oh. boy. Up, 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 up. 
Oh, oh dear, that's excited the nutter on the bus, and he started singing. Yeah, not a singing. Who would have thought he'd have known the second verse of the Greek national anthem? <laughs> And that the sheep would join in. <laughs> Put your muzzle on, boy. Put your muzzle on. And the weather outside is awful. <laughs> Lee Good. <laughs> that wasn't thunder. It's all right, boy, that wasn't thunder. That was just me eating crisps. It's all right. The birds are singing. The hills are alive. <laughs> the clouds are scudding by. Scud, scud. <laughs> oh, no! The nut has come back, and would you believe it? He's got them all in the pen. Well <laughs> done, indeed. <laughs> Time to move on to a game called Ecclesiastical Chat-Up Lines, in which the teams will be suggesting useful chat-up lines for vicars, priests, and other members of the clergy. Incidentally, while we're on a religious bent, I must refute the rumour that one of our team members walks on water. <laughs> Although it's true that Barry Cryer runs on lager. <laughs> OK, will you suggest the first ecclesiastical chat-up line, please? Tim. I say, now that's a habit I wouldn't mind getting into. <laughs> uh, how about... Um... I can think of something I'd like you to alter, boy. <laughs> Graham? Hello, would you like to be one of the lay sisterhood? <laughs> <laughs> if anyone can, the canon can. <laughs> you'll find that I move in mysterious ways. <laughs> Please kneel, and while you're kneeling... <laughs> I've got a jacuzzi font. <laughs> when you've done pulling the bells... <laughs> You stay here, I'll go and change. My vests are in the pantry and my pants are in the bedroom. <laughs> Good Friday, I'll make it even better. <laughs> right, get your habit, you've pulled. <laughs> it's time to play the game called Mornington Crescent. <laughs> the first... First, I have to announce the result of our Mornington Crescent audience response survey. <laughs> we, we asked 20,000 listeners, how would you rate your level of Mornington Crescent satisfaction? <laughs> Excellent, good, or merely well above average? And the reply we got back... <laughs> ..came from a Mrs Trellis of North Wales... <laughs> ..who I see has ticked the box marked neither good nor bad, and also the box is marked poor, very poor, really extremely poor. Words begin to escape me as to quite how poor and butter-clenchingly piss-poor. In fact, Mrs Trelly sent us back the wrong form. And if there's anyone listening at Virgin Rail wondering where it got to... We'll be happy to forward it. OK, on with the game teams, and this week we'll be playing the old Devonshire version, enjoyed by Sir Francis Drake himself. It basically follows the rules of standard Mornington Crescent, but differs in that players can knock their opponents out of position with a strike move. Players are traditionally over the age of 70 and wear white jackets. <laughs> so, as... As Samantha undoes the straps at the back... <laughs> ..to free your arms, teams, I'd like you to start, please, Tim. Archway. Cleveland Street. Hmm. <laughs> no. That's... Is that no okay? Content. No, I don't no know content. if he's either being mm. very stupid or very clever. No. I think, on balance, very <clears throat> stupid. <laughs> I'm very surprised that that's been allowed through. Um, Chalfont and Latimer. Oh. 
That's very good. That's good. I can, mm. that's, uh, mm. that's knocked him out of position. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> yeah, not that far out. Right? No, get, well, you can get back in. I'll get him through Baron's, Baron's Court. Got gone. Baron's Court. You see? Very good. Very good. Do you think it's best if I try and block him now? Uh, Surrey Keys. Very, very mm. canny. Mm. I go back out. Chesham. Yeah. Back out. No. Yeah. Always put a backstop. I know. <laughs> so the, only, the only thing to do with Chesham, then, is to... I don't Can I have Rich, Richmond Old Deer Park? I think some of the old deers would object. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just have ri I'll just have Richmond. OK, yeah, that's mm. I can have that. Um, can you do that in standard? Can you do one? <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, should knock before you go in, <laughs> Graham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was your question? No, uh, no question now, because I've got it. Morden. Oh. What? Good. Oh, right. Well, uh, it opens a bit of it a does it open. It does, it does open. I think he's Drink of yeah. light there. I'll yeah. Yeah. Put, it down, put it down the right and you can come on yeah. the left. OK, Patterson Road. Mornington Crescent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK, as we have Tony Hawks with us today, the team thought it would be a terrible missed opportunity not to play one round geared towards his special talent. And they were right, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so we carry on with a look at the folklore... <laughs> we carry on with a look at the folklore of the West Country. I brought along a selection of my favourite sayings, superstitions and local wisdom, which I'd like you to answer for me, teams. Graham, we'll start with you. What does it traditionally signal when Devon people dream of a pub or inn? Sorry, try it, fine. <laughs> That's my nightmare. <laughs> you mean when people in Devon dream of a pub? It means they're asleep. <laughs> well, actually, the answer is it signals that they'll inherit a huge fortune. Good <laughs> Lord. Barry, complete the following Cornish saying. Promises are like pie crusts. Except they're not on top of pies. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is made to be broken, obviously. Right, Tony, according to a Devon custom, how might a man find a girlfriend with the use of a snail? <laughs> I don't know, but if it works, I'll be well pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> I just spent 30 grand on a Porsche. <laughs> The answer is that you take a snail from a gooseberry bush and place it in some ashes. I want to meet the women in this part of the world. <laughs> now, the letter it makes in the ash will be the name of your lover. Oh. 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 A load of tosh. <laughs> Tim, complete the following West Country folklore. When the black back snails cross your path... You're jogging too slowly. <laughs> Well, the answer is the darkening clouds, much moisture, hearth, a uh, hath. <laughs> Graham again, complete the following rhyme, recited by Devon girls in front of a bowl of water. <laughs> I'll tell you, I can't get out of this county quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> Graham again, complete the following rhyme, recited by Devon girls in front of a bowl of water. <laughs> With the letters of the alphabet in it. <laughs> I place my shoes in the letter T in the hope... I'll pass English GCSE. <laughs> but it's really my true love I shall see. Barry, traditionally, why do Cornish folk put money outdoors on the windowsill on the 31st of December? Oh, that started in Lou. It used to be called Lou's Change. <laughs> They believe if they bring it in again on New Year's Eve, they'll be bringing in money all year. Fools. Oh. <laughs> what does it mean, Tony, if a shrew passes over your foot in Shaftesbury? You get shafted in Shrewsbury. <laughs> I'm afraid the answer is you'll walk with a limp for the rest of your life. 
With a limp and... what? <laughs> and Tim, complete the following traditional West Country weather saying. A cold May is... Not as willing as a hot June. <laughs> <laughs> Just wishful thinking. I like this county. <laughs> and the boring answer is kindly and fills the barns. <laughs> fills the barns? A cold May is kindly and fills the barns. A cold May is kindly and fills the barns. I don't know what it means either, but... <laughs> OK, our next game is all about famous names. Tim was saying earlier that after dinner at Michael Caine's house last week, both, both Tom Cruise and Julia Roberts confided in him how much they detest Weasley little name droppers. <laughs> all the same, it was nice of them to pop out and see how he was getting on with the dishes. And Tim's priceless showbiz anecdote inspired this new round called Name Droppers. In it, the teams will attempt surreptitiously to include the names of famous celebrities in day-to-day -day conversation. Points will be awarded commensurate to the weight of names successfully dropped. On a scale of up to ten for a Greater Garbo, a Frank Sinatra or a Humphrey Littleton, down, <laughs> down to one for a Wincy Willis or a Bob Holness. The Richard Whiteley name score is in the second place of decimals. While a Nicholas Parsons will get you disqualified and drug tested. <laughs> so while I go off to the medical unit, keep an ear out, Barry and Graham. Tim and Tony, start your name dropping now, please. Hello, Tony. Oh, hello, Tim. Oh, you won't guess who came to supper last night. Oh, you've got a cook, though, haven't you? No, no, we had to sue Cook for stealing. Uh, well, there's nothing worse than a Robin Cook. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the kids cooked it on the new Argo. You know, those. So much that the oven can't do that the aga can't. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm absolutely adamant about yes, it. Yes, yes, mm. yes. Yeah. Did you give the kids orders like yeah. John peel the potatoes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephen fry the onions, yeah. uh, Patrick Moore salt, please, yeah, yeah, yeah. James boil the pig's head? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that was just a description. Mm. Yeah. Now right. this uh, <laughs> about your uh, kids. Uh, haven't your Jeremy and Sean been working in uh, sketch, Liz? Yes, Sean operates a tumble dryer and Jeremy irons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, you and Victoria certainly have a large family. Do you plan to Roger Moore? <laughs> <laughs> no, but Victoria would. <laughs> According to our bank manager, Michael, we, we can't really afford it, but I told Michael flatly... <laughs> yeah, yeah, what do you tell him? What do you I tell said, him? cough up. I yeah. said, uh, but you bank with Lloyd, don't you? No, but Tony banks there. Um, he <laughs> says, uh, he says they'll sting you just for saying good morning. Oh, right. <laughs> Tony. Uh, have you seen this? I've got something really interesting in this innovations catalogue. Well, that's a novelty. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's what is it? A, it's a thing to help the kids keep their Toy Town characters tidy. Ah, yes, you mean... Uh... Yes. The, the Noddy, Noddy holder. holder, yes. <laughs> well, cheerio. Cheerio. Well, we're, we're fast approaching the end of the show, but it's just time to fit in around a fisherman's book club. So, while Samantha nips out to enjoy a portion of local Winkles Insider, I'd like you to... <laughs> I'd like, your teams, I'd like your teams to suggest titles to suit a mail-order book club for fishermen. Tony, will you start, please? Uh, far from the Madding Trout. <laughs> the Lord of the Flies, by J.R. Hartley. <laughs> Catch 22. <laughs> There's a sequel to the Barchester Chronicles, which is the Crotchester Barnacle. <laughs> is that by Anthony Scollop? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> the Sardinic Verses by Salmon Rushdie. <laughs> Moll Flounders. <laughs> Captain Corelli's Manta Ray. <laughs> Ten Rillington Place. Brat is a feminist issue. 
Lady Chattel is lobster. <laughs> and if you don't fancy a book, there's always top shelf prawn. <laughs> Three men and a bloater. <laughs> Great exaggerations. <laughs> the but Kipper and the Rose. <laughs> the Little Book of Clam. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, as the grubby raincoat of time opens to reveal the upright Member of Parliament. <laughs> and the categorical denial of destiny is swiftly followed by the resignation letter of fate. <laughs> I notice it's the end of the show, so from the teams, Samantha, myself and the good people of Plymouth, it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>